Welcome back to our discussion, Cybersecurity Compliance and Risk Management, sponsored by HID Global on Federal News Network. My guest today is Eve Massard, Product Marketing Director for Identity and Access Management Solutions at HID Global. I'm your moderator, John Thomas Flynn. Eve, before we, before we took a break, we were talking about mobility and uh, all the changes that have happened with citizen access to government. It can't be more important than it is these days. Talk a little bit more about that and the changes that evolved in the industry to address this issue. Yeah, so a lot has been done to make sure that you can use your phone to authenticate securely to your application. Uh, but when you're looking at mobility and citizen, you want to make sure that you don't provide one size fits all because with, uh, with citizen, it's a large pool of, uh, of users. And so some users actually might not be using mobile devices. So you want to make sure that you, you have alternate means of uh, authentication. Uh, but uh, for the vast majority that do have mobile devices, um, the user experience can be very easy and very straightforward. Uh, you know, uh, something that's very uh, popular when it comes to mobility with consumer or citizen is uh, push authentication, uh, where when you try to access your application, you're going to get a, a little, uh, a little uh, push notification on your phone that's mm -hmm. going to come through a separate channel. And it's a, it's a great way to shore up the security and, and prevent the, the kind of mind-in-the-middle attacks. So there, there's lots of things that have been done on the, the mobility to make it easier, make it more convenient, but at the same time also really increase the level of uh, uh, security that you provide to your end users. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be a big deal of just a few years ago when everybody was talking about, what is it, BYOD, bring mm -hmm. your own device. And everybody said, well, if everybody's bringing their own device, that complicates it even more. Let's have the organization itself issue the devices. Where does that argument stand these days? I think it really depends on the organization. Uh, you will find organization that, uh, you know, allows bring your own device. And in fact, it might be the only thing that the, the users have. But there's other organization where they will only accept, you know, government furnished equipment, right? So. It really depends on the organization. And then in the middle, you have some that, uh, that, that allows for both. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's really all across the map. On I haven't point. heard it uh, discussed much in the last couple of years, to tell mm -hmm. you the truth. That's why it's, I thought I'd bring it up just to see if it's still on the, on the radar. Uh, let's move over to uh, zero trust and multi-factor authentication. It's such a big issue anymore. Is that really the first place to start for state and local governments when th they're looking at the authentication process? Yeah, that would be a great place to start, uh, especially with the, the changes in the industry with cloud application and mobility. Um, it would be a, a great way to look at that and make sure that whenever you, uh, whenever you, um, uh, you access an application, you make sure it's the right person that access it. Uh, and really, you got to think about uh, multi-factor authentication as the foundation for zero trust. Uh, if you want to get to zero trust, uh, you don't get zero trust if you're not sure who's the right user and multi-factor authentication is really the way to go for that. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the major factors that we're facing within the, in the next couple years in terms of cybersecurity and compliance? What are the big things on the radar screen? I know we're going to get into coronavirus in a minute, but what about the other things that are so important these days? Yeah, so there's obviously a lot of uh, uh, on the news around ransomware. Um, and. Um, um, with ransomware, of course, having a good, uh, uh, you know, good strategy around backup, disaster recovery is important. Uh, but uh, multi-factor authentication can also help with that in uh, preventing it from spreading laterally. Uh, so uh, it has benefits there. Uh, 2020, of course, uh, election security is uh, uh, on top of the mind, and and that's not something that's going away. You know, <laughs> we're doing election every year, so. Uh, that's that's going to stay for for a long time, uh, and I think in general um, there is a um, uh, there is really a, a, an idea with uh, local and state that uh, you know they, they need to they need to catch up and uh, really uh, deploy stronger security so that they can keep providing the the, the vital services that they provide to the community um, because cybersecurity helps prevent. Uh, um, issues helps with the, the continuity of service, mm -hmm. and so that's that's really important. Yeah, well. uh, unfortunately, it's become somewhat of a political issue. Uh, the whole issue of uh, identification and voting. 
where uh, some look at it as a uh, barrier to voting, where others look at it and say, geez, if you have to show an ID to get on a plane, shouldn't you show an ID to vote? So these are some of the political implications yeah. and barriers that, that present themselves when you're trying to use technology to solve a problem that has more issues than just the technology itself. That, that's true. I think around election security, it's, it's definitely, you know, city, the citizen is a big part of that, but mm -hmm. I think also a lot of it is around infrastructure and those should be much less controversial because um, the, the, the citizen themselves, they, they don't interact a lot with the IT systems. Uh, you know, they might, uh, they might be using an e-voting booth, that kind of thing, but really it's all around the infrastructure that's, that's around there. And those are more the employees or the, the volunteers that works around the election. And, and you want to make sure that you start there in terms of cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. We've only got a minute or two left. Let's, uh, let's talk about this black swan, and that certainly is the coronavirus and the implications that it has, uh, especially for state and local, go well, for all government levels when you yeah. think about it, and private sector for that matter. But when uh, we're talking about, for the first time, I think a real, a real uh, a decision to move into the telework arena that's had its ebbs and flows over the last 15, 20 years, but now we're seeing, the, seeing that this is, an, this is uh, critical for government continuity. What does that term, what does that mean in terms of HID Global? Yeah, so what it means is uh, if you're gonna let your, uh, your users access uh, your application and your network remotely, you wanna make sure that it's your user and not some kind of hacker coming from across the world. And so strong authentication is a, is a really strong focus in this area. Um, and uh, HID provides uh, many solutions that uh, helps organization uh, adds that security so that when they enable their users to, to telecommute and, and provide that uh, continuity of service, uh, we are, we're, we're able to do that in a secure fashion. Well, hopefully we can have you back here in a couple of months and we won't have to talk about this anything more, anymore, right? Uh, I think that's gonna have to call it a day. I'd like to thank our guest, Yves Massard, Product Marketing Director for Identity and Access Management Solutions at HID Global. I'm your moderator, John Thomas Flynn, and you're listening to Federal News Network. For more on this discussion, visit federalnewsnetwork.com and search HID Global.